my fellow Americans, it's slowly getting time for the Express. Mm -hmm. This is the Express Hmm. with Gary Allen, your 360 degree view of the world. Now, here's your host, Gary Allen. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Express, and thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your day to join us. Gary Allen, and I am really looking forward to tonight's program. Our guest is already on the line, but we'll be getting to her in just a couple of minutes. Um, There's thunderstorms all over the place, Florida, San Antonio, California. There's just things going on all over the place. But to remind you, if you want to keep up with us here uh, on The Express, you can go to my Facebook at Gary Allen, A-L-A-N. You can also listen to some of my past shows on YouTube.com. That's Gary Allen, The Express Interviews. You're going to get a little confused because of Gary Allen, the country singer. He spells his name different. But if you uh, kind of look down a little bit, it'll be in blue lettering and, and it'll say Gary Allen, The Express Interviews. You'll be able to get there. As time progresses and more shows get on, on YouTube, things will get a lot easier. Thursday night at 7 o'clock, this show will repeat itself on diversitybroadcastnetwork.com with our dear friend Renee, also progressivevoices.com. And if you're running around in your car and you want to listen to us on on tunein.com, go ahead there, put in your favorite column, tmvcafe.com, and everything will pop in and you can listen to everything that goes on here at the network. Uh, First of all, I just want to say, for those of you that are listening to the news, Donald Trump just announced that he would actually sit down and have a conversation with Kim Jong-un from North Korea. Okay, that's a good reason for me not to vote for Donald (laughs) Trump. At any particular rate, we have a wonderful guest on with us tonight, and her name is Natalie Moore. She's a marriage and family therapist specializing in relationship coaching, dating, and marriage. She received her graduate degree from Harvard University, and then she went on to receive her master's degree in marriage and family therapy from my old alma mater, the University of Miami. Uh, Her book, It's a Match, The Guide to Finding Lasting Love is meant to be a guide that includes everything that a reader needs to know in order to find the one. Uh, If you want more information about Natalie, about relationship, dating, or marriage, subscribe to her blog at www.nataliemoore.net and follow her on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at Natalie Moore Expert. So I am very pleased not only to be able to have her on the program, but I'm also pleased to be able to call her my friend, Miss Natalie Moore. Natalie, welcome to the program. Hi, Gary. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for that, having me back. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Before we get into this, the other day on Facebook, you posted this, and I thought it was pretty cool. And I think it kind of pitches right in absolutely what we're talking about. We are magnificent beings who are completely deserving of love. And I absolutely agree with that 100%, and I think everybody does. It's unfortunate that... Some people will go through life and not really know what true love is. They think they know, but they're not really sure of what true love is. You're absolutely right. And I truly believe that we're all deserving of love. Unfortunately, as we grow up, we create these limiting beliefs based upon our past experiences that make us feel like we no longer deserve love. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, we have to clear these beliefs before we can let love in. Yeah. I, I, I was missed at the beginning of the show to say hello to Randy. Randy Jones is one of our, our avid listeners. He listens every, every week. You wrote this book because of your situation that you were involved in. And this first part of the program, we're going to talk about some of the things we did before and then bring you up to online dating, which is extremely important. And I never realized just how powerful of a tool that is for people who are searching for someone in their life. Uh, why the book, Natalie? I mean, uh, give us uh, the background on it. Well, I was single for a very long time, and as I was going through the dating process, including the online dating process, I kept looking for good good guys or reference books, you Mm -hmm. know, written by people who really knew. What I kept finding were books written by lay people, you know, teaching how to trap the one or how to trick him into this. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, being a marriage and family therapist, I knew that if you trap someone or trick them, you're not going to be able to hold on to them. Yeah. I mean, you have to f- have somebody who likes the real you and is attracted for the right reason in order to have a good relationship. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't find the book. So I decided I knew I mean, I knew mm-hmm. I had to write this book because I knew that there were a lot of people out there just like me. But mm-hmm. I had to live the experiences first 
so that I could be the person that book was written for. And so everything in the book I've done myself, yes, through the School of Hard Knocks, I did. But um, anyhow, that's why I know it's going to be very good for everyone because it uses everything that I learned as a marriage and family therapist as well as my actual experience out there in the field. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'll say this right up front. The gentleman in your life, I am so jealous of him, and I know he's listening to the program. And when I come down to Miami uh, to, to see you guys, I know, I know uh, he's going to look at me kind of awkwardly, but he's a very lucky man, and, and you, you used all of it all of this that's in the book in order to find this gentleman. And, and he's a very lucky man to have you in on his arms. And, and I, I'm jealous of him to no end. <laughs> I'll be sure to tell him that. Yeah. Oh, and that'll make for a real interesting <laughs> evening as we sit there and talk. I'll tell you that right now. What? That's what exactly a, right. Yeah. I mean, he's a heck of a, a heck of a great gentleman, but I am jealous. Uh, at any rate, uh, what are some of the most common mistakes before we get too far into the book here, but what are some of the common mistakes that people make about going out and searching for that one, that person? Um, I, I know that all my life I was attracted to a certain type of woman. And, uh, every time I got into a relationship with that type of person, it never really went anywhere or it never lasted anywhere. And, uh, and or if I got into a relationship too soon and we had uh, uh, intimate relations right away, it never seemed to last. Is that pretty true of a lot of people that that we go in thinking this is our type or that's our type where we need to be a little open mind, a little more open minded. And, and that's one of our common mistakes. Well, we all have the tendency to keep repeating the same pattern. So, for example, if you like narcissistic people, you always will, even though you keep having bad experiences. We call it repetition compulsion. So until you find out what your patterns are, you can't break them. And then the second thing you ask, what is the biggest mistake uh, when you go out there looking for someone? I think that is if you go out there looking from a place of need. If you're needy and you can't stand to be alone, you're going to settle for anything and make anyone fit your circumstances. When in reality you're really trying to fill an empty hole. Yeah, I have so a I friend think, of mine. Yeah, I have a friend of mine in Miami who doesn't like to be alone and he goes from relationship to relationship just so he has a companion, but none of them really last very long. Well, of course not because how can you um if you're not comfortable with yourself alone, how can you uh expect somebody else to fill that emptiness? So you really have to get to a place where you have enough self-love and you like your own company and mm -hmm. you're comfortable being alone. So from that place of strength you go find somebody to compliment you not to fill you right i had a i had a grant my grandmother and and a couple of my aunts as i was growing up and 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 actually other family members my two sisters in particular used to say gary if you get comfortable in your own shell then you're ready to meet other people whether it be a relationship a friendship or or an in, or a relationship of love uh, that's very very important i, I want to go over that that's very important that you need to know who you are in order to branch out not only with uh, finding your mate, but finding other relationships as well, correct? Yes, correct. And also you have to, as you said, you have to know who you are. That means also identifying what beliefs you have about yourself and relationships that stand in your way of finding the one. So, for example, if you feel like, oh, relationships always work out for other people, but not for me, uh, or I'm done with that, you know, I've already had enough hardships i don't i'm never going to find someone mm -hmm. guess what you're creating your own reality with those thoughts so once you have to identify what stands in the way of your happiness and then work to clear those limiting beliefs and find out why they're not really true right right and that takes time it, it doesn't happen overnight um no but my book guides you through how to do this oh yes the, the book itself is magnificent I mean, I'm, I've been reading it and reading it and reading it. And of course, you know, <laughs> since, since, since I, our friendship blossomed and everything, you know, I, I met someone and I do have someone in right. my life now. We're taking it very slowly, one step at a time, but it, it's, it's actually very comforting and wonderful to have uh, this young lady in my world. That, that's for sure. Um, well, do I think what you're doing is correct because I, I, you said the magic word, taking it slowly. Most people try to have an instant relationship. Yeah. And, and, you know, you build trust over time. So taking it slowly is really smart because you're building, building something solid. 
Yeah, and and believe me, and distance is a pro- I mean, she lives a little east of me here, but at the same time, it's just important for her and I to take it very slowly because it's been a lot of years since I really cared about anybody other than Gary or my immediate family and friends. So it's kind of nice and comforting. Do many relationships begin, and I mentioned it at the top of the program, about the uh, sexual attraction. Do many people mistake that for love and get involved? And then when that burns out, they kind of uh, just move on to the next sexual conquest. I mean, I, I realize when you're young, that's par for the course. But as you get older, do, do people who refuse to grow up still use sex as the main attraction and then can't figure out why their relationships don't last? Well, the first part of falling in love uh, is really a chemical reaction that is made so that you actually take the risk of falling in love. It creates a high and a lot of people feel like when that high starts to wear off, you don't have that rush when you see the person. Uh, you, they feel like, oh, you know, maybe this is not the one. And so they move on. Where what they're actually doing, their relationship is actually evolving into the st- second stage of romance. So it's very important to understand that. Uh, other people... And in the case of women, if they have sex too soon, uh, they, they bond with a man uh, because of, the, of hormones that are released that cause a woman to bond with her mate. However, a man bonds through time. So if a woman has sex before the, with a man, she bonds to him. But if, he has, if they have not been dating long enough, he doesn't bond to her and he's ready to move on to the next one because yeah. the thrill of the chase is gone. Yeah, I, and, and I've seen that happen not only in my own uh, personal life, but I've seen it happen with others, and it it it, boy, it, it's lonely. I got to tell you, it does leave you uh, with a lonely feeling somewhere down deep inside. And as I've gotten older, Natalie, I want something more out of a relationship than just sex. I want something deeper, more meaningful that that that's going to last. I mean, I'm no spring chicken, that's for sure. And hey, that's called maturity. Really. You mean I'm finally getting to that point? I didn't realize I was actually getting there. My mom was right. Someday I would mature. I don't know. My sister would be proud of me. My sister would be proud of me. When people get I'm involved. Sure she would. Yeah, she would. She she she's wonderful. Um and I have two of them. Uh when people get involved in relationships, besides the sexual attraction that is there for women, they bond right away. Men kind of we're dogs, we move on. Let's talk about baggage in relationships for a little bit. And in chapter four, you call it cleaning out your closet. And But a lot of people bring bad baggage with them, and they continue to compare, not give a new person an understanding or, or a better chance. Shouldn't you just learn to leave your baggage behind and say, oh, well, I made those mistakes, but I don't need to continue to bring it with me? Or is it an unconscious thing that we bring our baggage with us no matter what? Well, oftentimes it's unconscious because, I mean, really, who wants to lug around suitcases worth of baggage, right? Mm -hmm. But for example, let's say you have a contentious relationship and you break up with the person, but you're still angry at your ex. Well, guess what? You're going to bring that anger into your next relationship and project it onto the new person Mm -hmm. because that's what happens. I mean, so you subconsciously bring this anger into the person, uh, let's say uh, a woman, you you bring it onto the next woman. Mm -hmm. And so that's bringing your baggage. And so over time, you really have to get over each relationship before you move on to the next one. Getting over means forgiving. And forgiving sometimes doesn't mean, hey, what you did was okay. It just Mm -hmm. means like, you know what? I'm ready to move on and I'm letting it all go. Right. You're done, you know? And so that's how you clean it. You identify what baggage you have and then you let it go. Do women involves forgiveness. Do women hold on to their anger more than men? And because women usually have closer bonds in friendships with other women, uh, do they kind of enable that person to continue on with that baggage? Or does it just depend on the personality and your friends? Because I, I know you ladies like to get together. And uh, if I was a dog, I'm <laughs> always a dog kind of a thing. Do women hold on to that anger a little bit longer and sort of like the old saying, uh, uh, you know, vengeance? Uh, women come back 10 times more than men do. 
I don't think so. I think it's a personality thing. Uh, for example, my I don't I don't like letting anybody live rent free in my head. So why would I hold on anger, which is really mm-hmm. letting someone stay rent free in my head? Mm-hmm. So uh, for me, it's I tend to just move on, and I teach people that forgiveness is not for the other person; it's for yourself, so that you can move on. Uh, so it's it's really uh, a matter of who you are as a person and how much work you've done on yourself. I I know a lot of men who are very angry at women. Yeah, yeah. I I had a couple of buddies of mine who came back from the military when we served overseas, and when they came back, their wives had been cheating on them. And oh um, yeah. Um, and a couple of them, couple, uh, two of the guys committed suicide, which I, I'll be honest with you, oh, as, no. a, as a man or a woman, there's three things that I've always said, Natalie. Uh, if I'm in a relationship with a woman and I break off, yeah, I'm going to be ticked off for a while or she's going to be ticked off, but I'm not going to do anything to her physically. I'm not going to kill anybody over it. I'm not going to destroy property over it. I mean, I'm going to just move on and move on with my life. But it is amazing in our society when you turn on the TV and, and, you, and you see it where a man couldn't let go of a woman or the woman couldn't let go of the man. And six months to a year later, somebody is laying dead in a coffin somewhere because of the jealousy or the anger over it. I, I don't get it. No one is worth losing your life over. And if you kill somebody, you're going to lose your life. You're going to prison. So, of course, well, those are called crimes of passion. Oftentimes, they're not premeditated. Uh, however, uh, you know, I, I think that you have to understand, and I'm not talking about your your buddies who are in the army. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about regular relationships. Uh, an affair is just a symptom of the problems in the relationship. It's mm-hmm. not the cause of the breakup. Mm-hmm. So there were there were obviously a lot of problems, unless, of course, you know you're. Uh, you're married to a sex addict or something. Uh, but generally speaking, there are problems in the relationship that lead to the affair. They're not mm-hmm. the cause of, they're just a symptom. And most people don't realize that because they want to blame some, something other than themselves. Yeah. So each person has to take responsibility where they let go of their half of the relationship when there's an I, affair. I know this is going to sound silly, but one of my friends was talking to me today, and I know he's listening out there, Rick is, and he wanted to know, do you ever watch, and I've seen it a, a number of times, the show Cheaters? Can I tell you? I mean, I guess now I'm telling the whole audience, I haven't watched TV in about 25 years. Uh, so the answer is no. And I, well, it's terrible it, to admit because it makes me a weirdo, but... No, I, it, the show is based on, you know, obviously couples, one is cheating on the other. And usually the cheating occurs, and this probably... Uh, is about an awful lot of the people that are out there in the world. Usually the person that's doing the cheating is, is home, either a college student or married. And the husband or the wife is out working 20 hours a week or, or, you know, two jobs, 50 or 60 hours a week. And they feel lonely and they automatically go and cheat. If you're going to do that, you don't belong in that relationship to begin with. Correct. Of course not. But you know what? A lot of things broke down before that cheating happened. What happens is most people are afraid of intimacy, really talking about their feelings and their fears about things. Mm -hmm. And so instead of talking about what's happening to them because they're afraid of the intimacy, then they wait till it's, you know, there's a total breakdown in the relationship and then they act out by cheating. Yeah. Well, that probably gets, yeah, go ahead. So I think, so, uh, you know, I have identified 10 different areas where you have to be intimate in. And that means talking beyond the facts about things, but you have to be able to talk about your fears, your dreams, all of that. And those 10 different areas to maintain your relationship healthy. That would that be your common, your core values? No, that's what I call uh, my shared areas of intimacy, Mm -hmm. um, which are the 10 intimacies. And I, I say that for relationships to be a lasting one based upon informal research, um, it has, you have to have shared core values. You know, those are things that are very important to you, fundamental to your being, such as like family is really important to me, or my religion is very important to me, uh, or honesty uh, is very important. Uh, so you have to have shared core values, and you also have to have a large number of shared areas of intimacy. So out of those 10 areas of intimacy, you have to be able to speak about five, six, or seven of them 
you know, uh, beyond the facts Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. on a regular basis, because, you know, as you, as you are together with somebody for a long time, each one of you is growing. And if you don't continue speaking about these areas, then you don't know if you're growing apart until suddenly the chasm is so wide that you don't know each other or you find one of you is cheating. Yeah. We're talking to Natalie Moore, the author of It's a Match, The Guide to Finding Lasting Love. And uh, this is Natalie's second visit with us. She's going to be with us numerous times throughout the rest of the year as we talk about all these things. Let's talk a little bit about those intimacies and your core values. You mentioned religion uh, and common interests and one's work ethic, which which is part and partial to what we're going to talk about when it comes to online dating, which we will get to in just a little bit. But your core values, I know how important those are because you, you've devoted a little bit, uh, quite a bit in the book about it. But when you first begin to get to know somebody in a relationship, is it important right. to find out about how they re- interact with other people? I mean, let's be honest. There are a lot of people that get involved in relationships and the girlfriends don't like the new boyfriend and the guys don't like the new girlfriend, et cetera, et cetera. But is it important to find out how each other reacts or, or, or interacts with, uh, with other people out in the world to find out how they fit into your life? Of course. For example, uh, you can learn a lot by just watching somebody else interact from your first date to – Let's say how they treat the waitress or anybody who they feel is not at their equal level because they're paying for something so they will will mistreat a waitress. If somebody mistreats a waitress, they're just mean. Yeah. (laughs) And so no matter how sweet they are to you, if they do that to somebody else, that's really who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to impress you. So watch how people behave. Also, when you see someone with their friends, what are the friends saying about the person? How are they interacting? Are they respectful? Uh, you know, how, what do they talk about? Uh, what do they do? Uh, are they mean? Um, you know, all of those things, are, or are they kind and generous? Mm-hmm. Those are the things that you really want to watch because when someone's trying to impress you, they will put their best foot forward. Right. But when, they let down their guard around family and friends. When you're first seeing someone, uh, put yourself in this place, Natalie. When you're first seeing someone, and you're 25 years old, <clears throat> and you have a group of girlfriends, and now you meet somebody. Is it plausible that some of your girlfriends may not like said boyfriend or, or dating boyfriend out of jealousy? Oh, I may lose Natalie as a friend, and he's got her, and we can't do the same thing on Thursday night that we used to do. I mean, do you as Natalie, the person in the relationship, need to take a lot of that into account if you're astute enough and a lot of people aren't there, aren't, aren't you, but uh, if you're astute enough, do you recognize those jealousies and those uh, moments when you say, hey, you know, this is a relationship I'm into. You're not. You know, I'm moving on with my life a little bit here, and, and I need to have someone in my life, and, and you're not it other than being a friend. I, I agree with you, but I think <clears throat> at 25 years old, you're very different uh, developmentally, at a different developmental stage than if you were 35 or 40. Mm-hmm. So, for example, at 25, you're still coming off of college, and now with the millennials and everything else, they are in a different place. So they still have that group and her- or herd mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yes, what you need to do is examine what is it that your friend is telling you about the person you care about. Uh, are they valid points, or are, could it be that they're jealous because they take time away from you? And, I mean, that happens at all ages. Uh, but you need to examine where the person is coming from with their comments and whether their comments are valid, because oftentimes our friends can see something in the other person that we can't see because we're too uh, close. Remember that first stage of dating, Mm -hmm. one that makes you fall in love? Well, it Mm -hmm. also makes you see the other person through rose-colored glasses. Mm. So therefore, you might miss some of the things. So it's important to listen but also important to uh, evaluate from where that person is coming from. Uh, Some of the other core values that you talk about work ethic is extremely important and how, how do they feel about pets and children, et cetera, and how they interact with, with those things in your life. Um, Those are extremely important as well. Correct. Well, I think how they feel about children, of course, because, you know, but for example, if family is a strong core value, uh, and somebody says, oh, yes, that's my strong core value, but they don't pay attention to their parents or their siblings, 
mm-hmm. then you know that that's not really true. So you need to watch that. But <clears throat> also, I mean, if do you want children or not is a big question that you need to ask mm-hmm. if you're in a childbearing ages. And mm-hmm. also work ethics. Okay, so some people have as a core value accumulation of wealth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, or being debt free could be uh, one of the core values. Hmm. So that requires, you know, work. Yeah. But other people, um, you know, so, but work ethics, like when you talked about somebody who works 60 hours a week, uh, a lot of times people who do that uh, and they don't have to do it to support a household, they do it because they're workaholics. And that's just a way of avoiding intimacy. Yeah, yeah. You talked about the childbearing years, and now we find out that uh, Michael Jackson's sister, I think Latoya, uh, yes. it, at, at 50 years old, is expecting a child. So I I, I kind of wonder if the biological clocks have been increased a little bit for women as far as certain age brackets are concerned. I have a feeling that that's really a lot of fertility clinic work, you know, <clears throat> because it's yeah. almost impossible uh, unless you have a lot of help from science. But, I mean, those are issues that, that we all care about, you know, obviously at some point in our lives, whether we want children mm-hmm. or not. And if you're dating the second or third time around, uh, let's suppose your children are grown up and the other person has young children. You need to talk about that. Are you really willing? Or, and you also need to examine yourself. Are you really willing to start over again? And you need to examine that up front because it's not fair to get children involved and everybody else involved and then later say hey i can't do this yeah ew just uh gave me a little uh something here it says a 70 year old woman in india just delivered her first child whoa whoa (laughs) um again i i don't know if that involves science or not because i know that you can transplant (laughs) embryos into a womb but i you know at 70 years old i don't know i mean i think it's quite miraculous Oh yeah, that's a miracle. Oh, that's a miracle. That's for sure. <laughs> one of the most common mis- one of the most common mistakes I see a lot of my friends make over the years, and I've probably made it too, was the adage. And women tend to mommy their their boyfriends and even their girlfriends if 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 they are inclined to go that way. Um, they want to change somebody once they get into a relationship. And I think that's so wrong. If you can't accept that person now, you know, the fact that they drop their clothes wherever they take them off is one thing. You can change that or or how they clean up after themselves. You can change that. But certain aspects of a relationship and, 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 and a personality can't be changed. Is that a dangerous thing to think, oh, I'll change them once I'm in a relationship? It totally is because, uh, first of all, most people don't like change <clears throat> and never mind force change. So it seems to be, it's almost like taking on a project. Mm-hmm. So why are you focusing on changing somebody else's personality? Uh, if it, usually people who do that don't want to take a good look at themselves, so they focus on someone else. Right. Uh, and I, absolutely not. You, never, you can never go out with anybody that you think will change, or you can change them because that will never happen. <laughs> right, right. Um, is in, independence extremely important as well? Well, I think interdependence <clears throat> is important. Mm-hmm. That means that there are two independent people who are healthy emotionally, who can be independent, but in a relationship, they, they can be interdependent on each other, not dependent. That means that each can hold his own weight, but yet they come together as partners to depend on each, to work together as partners. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, not being dependent or codependent. Right. And that's a, uh, a quite a nuance because when you're codependent, you want to always make sure the other person's feelings, you know, you want to take care of their feelings and everything else, which doesn't allow you to be very honest. Right. Um, and um, so I think it's interdependence is more important than independence. We're talking to Natalie and Moore. Really- yeah, we're talking to Natalie Moore, author of It's a Match, The Guide to Finding Lasting Love. Natalie, let's move on here before we go into the online dating which we're going to get to in the next five minutes um a couple of things i want to tackle here uh what is the law of attraction and how frequency vibrations work in finding the right match well you know that's a very old spiritual adage uh, and law however it's been proven scientifically 
and there's Dr. David Hawkins who wrote a book called Power Versus Force, and he measured the vibrational frequency of each emotion. And so what that says basically, and th- there was another uh, scientist who proved uh, that our bodies, our molecules store all emotions, which they store as vibrational frequency. And she was a, a chemist, a biochemist from Georgetown. So science is now proving what the spiritual uh, sages have known throughout, the, throughout, and that's basically our body has a frequency vibration. And like attracts like. And so if you're vibrating in, uh, at a very low vibration, which means you have a lot of anger, guilt, or uh, those kind of feelings, you're going to attract somebody who mirrors you. Mm. So if you want to attract a different person, you've got to change your vibration. And how do you do that? By changing your mind, by clearing out those, those lower vibrating feelings, such as anger, um, you know, grief and all of these things, by dealing with them, not by stuffing them. You have to mm. deal with them and actually clear them out. Because then you can, only then can you attract a higher level person. Mm-hmm. So in you other words, become uh, well, what you want. Oh, okay. So in other words, you have to really assess yourself. You have to sort of change yourself to where you want to go. If you want this kind of person, you got to kind of move in that direction. Otherwise, you're just going to keep repeating the same things. Exactly, because your vibrational frequency will not be able to sustain a higher level person. So therefore, uh-huh. you have to become what you want to find. <laughs> Ah, well, that's well, you know, that kind of goes into what I was discussing last week with my guest. And that was that sometimes we take aspects of other people's personalities and we incorporate incorporate them into our personality, things that we find appealing. And that helps us grow as a person. Is this sort of like the same thing? Uh, We see a person we really want to get involved with uh, in a relationship. So we find out their qualities and we kind of gravitate to that and pick up their qualities and move forward in that direction. Somewhat. If the qualities that we're talking about are a kindness, uh, you know, the, all the positive things, the kindness, generosity, mm-hmm. uh, empathy, yes. Uh, but if it's, oh, to be more outgoing or uh, more, of, more of an athlete, then no. Because this is, really has to come from the <clears throat> feelings level. Mm-hmm. So if you uh, love yourself, for example, you will find somebody who will love you. Mm-hmm. Because you're putting out to the universe that you're lovable and you're not going to put anything, you're not going to accept anything else because that's how you behave towards yourself. But you have to be careful. And, There's a fine line between loving yourself and narcissism, right? But of course. But loving yourself is being able to, for example, set healthy boundaries. You say, hey, I'm not willing to take that kind of behavior from you or I'm not going to, uh, or I'm tired, I need to rest now. Mm-hmm. It's, it's setting healthy boundaries. Um and it's also doing things that are good for you, it's from eating well, exercising. You know, you show self-love by your actions. Ah. Oh, well, there you go. I mean, that, that's cool. And, and also, I think having a bright outlook on life, happy, happy-go-lucky. And, you know, we all, we all have moments where we're down. You've, you and I have talked on the phone when I'm feeling a little down and all. But it, the idea, it's not, not that you got knocked down or you're feeling down today. It's getting back up there. <clears throat> And getting back into the race again and, and, you know, never let them see a sweat is what one acting teacher once said to me uh, a, a long, long time ago. I, I guess that prevails. Let's move into online dating. And this was interesting. This is in your book. It's a match. The Guide to Finding Lasting Love. We're talking to Natalie Moore. Chapter six. I didn't know this, that Harvard University back in 1965 did a survey uh, which paved the way for today's modern online dating. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, it was actually two undergrads <laughs> at Harvard who decided to do a survey. Then they called it a psycho- uh, social experiment. And they actually uh, sent out surveys to many, many people. And people paid, uh, filled them out, paid $3, mm-hmm. and the results of these surveys were going to be used to match them up to somebody else, to their match. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people paid money for this. And so that was, of course it was by, it was written and it was um, done that way. It wasn't, you know, you couldn't look at someone's profiles or pictures, but that was like the first foray that we know of Mm -hmm. 
uh, towards matchmaking using uh, profiles, you know, online questionnaire, questionnaires and all of that. Right. Now, of course, it wasn't really until about 1995 uh, with Match.com, which is the, probably the oldest um, the online dating site that re- it really took off. When you first started looking out there, and, and I'll be honest with you, um, I have had friends who have tried online dating. I've never tried it. Um, I lived in Las Vegas for 10 years, as you well know. So I didn't really mm-hmm. need online dating. I could, I could, <laughs> as ugly as I am, I, some women, I guess they like <laughs> the stand-up comic. You know, someone once said to me, you know, uh, I, I was out on the road traveling with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Tom Jones. And I forget where we were, and a newspaper asked him, a newspaper reporter asked him, you know, what types of women are attracted to you? And, he's, and he just said, you know, all women do. And he looked at me, and he said, what type of women are attracted to you, uh, uh, Mr. Allen? And I said, oh, the late-night waitress at Denny's. You're terrible. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm terrible. I, I am really You're terrible. You're bad. I know. I am really bad. Let's get into these 10 skills needed to succeed in finding lasting love on online dating. Um, well, you know, let's start with something else. You know, online dating, first mm-hmm. of all, um, it's really become the game changer because it increases your chances of finding the one exponentially because you're <laughs> no longer limited to the person you meet at Denny's or the mm-hmm. person you meet at the neighborhood bar or through your friend. Right. But rather you have a whole universe out there. However, most people don't realize, myself included, because I quit three different times that I started doing uh, online dating because it was such a terrible experience. And then I realized, oh, my God, it's because I'm doing this wrong. So I had to start analyzing to see what the skills were and what was successful and what wasn't. And so I came up, as you said, with the 10 skills that are needed uh, to succeed in online dating. And I put them in my book, Mm -hmm. and I'm actually now creating an online webinar for uh, uh, dating on webinar for online dating with about eight videos and a workbook because unless you really have these down you're not going to be successful and online dating is so important for Mm -hmm. finding the one that i just really wanted to do this so for you you had questions about online dating at the very beginning as well well i mean i i i did the usual oh my i threw up a profile And I hated the interactions I was having, so I literally quit three times until I decided, hey, wait a second, you're a marriage and family therapist, and you're analytical, Uh, let's use the brain and our knowledge and synthesize a system here, and that's what I did. I know that you said in our last discussion when you were on with us before that online dating is an extremely important tool for people who are wealthy who are workaholics because it cuts down on going from bar to bar, party to party, because let's face it, you can try to fix somebody up, but it's probably better to go this way. And it cuts down on some of the confusion for them. But there's a lot of problems as we're going to get to with these 10 questions. Uh, But let's start off with, you say a picture is worth a thousand words and you have to choose the right picture. Is there not a lot of phoniness on the online dating with pictures? Yes, but let me just clarify one point. It's uh, online dating is not just for wealthy people who are workaholics. It's for hmm. everybody. Oh no, we're I mean all that. Busy. Yeah, 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 I know. We're yeah, all yeah. busy. But I mean, uh, I know the yeah. last time we talked about it, you you had mentioned that for for people who are workaholics or people who have a few bucks in the bank who, who you know don't have the time uh, to go out to skipping around and finding different people that, wow, this is a, a shortcut for them to find maybe the right person. That's really where I was going with that one. Yes, but you're right. A, per, a picture is really worth a, a thousand words. And when you look at the profiles, first of all, the, uh, there's a skill to analyzing other people's pictures. Like what do the pictures say, say mm-hmm. about them? For example, I recommend having one professional picture mm-hmm. And then having some candid photos, because mm-hmm. what you want to show is the best version of you. Mm. So I would say absolutely no selfies, because that really subconsciously uh, tells the other person that person has no friends who can take <laughs> a picture of him. <laughs> so, I mean, and for and you know for uh, for men, please like no wife beaters on or a workout shirts or a shirtless mm. pictures, and mm. women. 
please, you know, just leave those bikini tops at home because oh. unless you're trying to uh, advertise for sex, that really uh, is not the right picture to put up there. Because Boy, if I, you advertise well, for sex, you'll be getting it. Boy, am I getting a lot of that on Facebook, if you've noticed lately. There's a lot of that going on. Uh, I'll, I'll answer somebody and they'll go, hello, how are you? And I'm old enough to be their father or grandfather, and it's like – Uh, I don't have time for this. And then you find out later they unfriend you, which is fine. I don't really need that right now in my life. But a lot of people will put a picture on there that was from 20 years ago. And that's not very fair at all either. No, because what they do is my, my theory is that you should show the best version of you and always, but the real you, because what you want to attract is somebody who's attracted to you just Mm -hmm. as you are. Because otherwise, you're going to be wasting a lot of time. And mm. in terms of dating efficiency, it doesn't work. So if you put some, a picture that's 20 pounds and 20 years ago, uh, when they see you, and I've met, you know, guys have told me, oh, my God, I, I showed up at this place to meet this woman, and I'm looking around, and finally I get tapped on the shoulder, and I don't recognize her. Mm-hmm. Now, first of all, if that happens, you feel like, okay, here's lie number one. Right. What else is she lying about, right? Or what right. else is he lying about? <laughs> right. So right. I think, uh, you know, I don't mind uh, if, let's say, you can use a little uh, touch-up with uh, Photoshop, mm-hmm. but but really you should show who you are. So the person is not surprised. Mm-hmm. And it's even better if they say, well, you look better in person than in your picture. <laughs> well, my mother used to always, <laughs> my mother always used to say I had a perfect face for radio. So I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You're terrible. The so next that's thing, one of the yeah, things. Yeah. The next thing that you talk about is choosing the right tagline to create the first, the right first impression. What are you talking about? Okay. So a lot of the, uh, the sites have a tagline that you put under your username. Mm-hmm. So when you, for example, if you put, uh, I've been there, done that, now it's my term. My time? What mm-hmm. does that tell somebody? Like, Nothing. oh, my God, like, stay away from her. No, stay away with a 10-foot pole because it's all about her now. Um, you know, or she's or she's angry or, you know, or whatever. Uh, but what about if you say, um, ready for my next adventure or ready for, uh, ready to find the right one or something like that. It says something very different from down in the dumps, you know? So let's say mm-hmm. you were saying down in, I'm down in the dumps. Or, mm-hmm. So finding the right tagline mm-hmm. is very important because it's after the picture, people look at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, I know what, what my tag, I know what my tagline would be tired of the late night waitresses at Denny's help. Well, the, but then you, of course that would make you seem like you're hard up. <laughs> Well, so I mean, who, who would want to go there, you know, you know, and, and by the way, the reporter said to me, late night waitresses at Denny's and Tom turned around and said, yeah, because by the time we get off stage, it's three o'clock in the morning. So, you know, that's the only place it's open. <laughs> so, you know, but but wouldn't that sound, <clears throat> you know, ready for my next adventure? Couldn't somebody read into that more than, you know, than they should? Well, yes. And so, for example, I. You could put life is an adventure ready to be experienced or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's like your philosophy. Uh, yes, you actually, you do have to be a little bit careful of how you use adventure. Um, and particularly if you're, uh, if you, but if you have that with photos that are very conservative, it could look like you look at life as an adventure. Mm. Um, you write the perfect profile that shows the best real you. What do you mean by the best okay. real you? Okay, so first of all, uh, I would show, <clears throat> I would put things in positive terms. For example, as a therapist, if I wrote, I sit around and listen to people's problems all day long. Now, does that sound very enticing? No. No, right? But I no. could say the same thing <clears throat> by saying, uh, I help people find their, uh, their, their true love and uh, live better and happier lives. Does that hmm. sound better? Yes. Okay, so it's but both things are the truth, right? Right. So, uh, but I'm showing, but I'm going to show the best truth, which is the one that makes me sound more positive, more upbeat. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to show your personality, 
uh, you want to sound like, you know, you don't want to talk about your exes there. Mm -hmm. Uh, You want to talk about, uh, you know, what's going right in your life and and maybe use a little humor Mm -hmm. uh, because you have a few minutes or one minute really to say for someone to say, I really want to get to know that person. Mm -hmm. Really that short a time. Well, people glance really quickly. <clears throat> See, you, you, know you know, I one, haven't. You know, I've never been on these sites. But it's just the questions I'm asking. No, no, no. But that's okay because a lot of people. I mean, they start reading the profile, so you sort of have to grab them initially. Mm-hmm. And if you sound like you're fun, uh, you know, you have a positive outlook on life, a can-do attitude, um, then you're more enticing than someone who's sitting there like. My ex-husband just left me, you know, for uh, for a younger woman, and I, you know, I'm really down, and I, you probably won't respond to this. And if you write something like that, who's going to want to respond? <clears throat> yeah, true, true. But you know, one of right. the question, one of the things that I, I I believe I understand about some of these um, sites is the questionnaire. I guess one of them, eHarmony, the questionnaire is like lengthy at best. Right. Well, a lot of the sites use algorithms, which means mathematical formulas to figure out who your match is. Mm-hmm. And eHarmony ha- does ask you about 400 questions. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, I, but the one thing to remember with eHarmony, they say because they ask you the 400 questions, they find a better match. What I also found out was that everyone can look at every answer you gave to, one of those, to any one of those questions. Mm-hmm. So if you start interacting with somebody, they can look at that. And so, for example, if one of the questions I remember was, uh, do you think marijuana should be legalized? And if you put no, people are going to say, why don't you think so? And Mm. then what you thought was private is really not private. So that's something to keep in mind, too. Yeah, I suppose. With, uh, with eHarmony. I, I like the format of a match.com because if somebody takes the time to write a profile, mm-hmm. it actually means that they're serious about finding uh, a lasting love. And I only write about lasting love. I can teach you how to find a hookup, you know, mm. very quickly. But that's not really what I teach people. I want them to find a lasting love. So if somebody takes the time, if they're yeah. serious about finding love, you're mm-hmm. going to take the time to do all the work. Hey, I can f- help you find a quick hookup too. You, you got seventy five bucks yeah. in a car. You, uh, you can. You live in Miami. You can just go down to Biscayne Boulevard. You'll find it in five minutes. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt about well, it. Uh, probably. I... Well, you're too much of a lady. I'm. 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 I'm a dog. So there's no doubt about it. But <laughs> should you confer with your friends as far as writing your profile? Because I know, for instance, when I had to put out my resume. Uh, I had a friend of mine write it for me because I, I found it difficult to write it, something about myself. I know I have an ego, a healthy ego, and I know I'm very outgoing. But when I have to look at look into myself and write about myself, it's very difficult. Is that an important tool to have a friend that you really trust that can maybe help you write the profile that will come across as someone who really is looking for someone in a, a long-lasting relationship? Well, that was my mistake number one. <clears throat> So I had my friends write my profile. Well, mm. of course, it didn't sound like me. You know, it didn't, it, it didn't have my voice. So I once, one, one of the times when I quit, I said, oh, oh, I've got to just rewrite my own profile. But you mm-hmm. can use your friends to remind you of what some of your better qualities are. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, you could say my friends would describe me as that it is honest, you know, uh, the one to, they can depend on or whatever. You, uh, so they're good to remind you and to do a proofreading of it, mm-hmm. but it's not good for anybody else to write your own profile because nobody sounds like you. Yeah, that's true. Oh, well, this person, also, knew, uh, this person knew me I, oh too well. But a resume is very different from a profile. Yeah. And, you know, it's basically listing, you know, your career achievements and it's linear. Where a profile, you want your personality to shine through it. Yeah. So yeah, I right. actually recommend I actually recommend dictating it, really, because when we write, it sounds different from when we dictate in it, and you know it types it on the computer. Yeah, you also talk about flirting online, testing the waters before diving in with the first email. 
Now, can that not be a dangerous thing to do if you go too far with it, if you don't know when when to say no, stop the flirting, just a little bit of a tease? Um, for example, uh, you know, most women uh, generally do not write the first email, but mm-hmm. men usually do. But for example, if you're a woman, one way to flirt online is you can send a like. You know, if you like a guy that you're looking at, you can just send a little like. Mm-hmm. And he receives a like, like just a little nudge. Hey, you know, you look pretty good when I was looking through here. Mm-hmm. And if he likes you, he'll look back and then he'll send an e- email. Mm-hmm. Or if you really, really think somebody's great, you can favorite him. Mm-hmm. And he receives a list of who's, who's uh, you know, uh, on whose list he's being a favorite. So then he can go, wow, I'm her favorite. Let me really look at this profile. Mm. So those are some of the things. Now, if somebody sends you likes or favorites and you don't like them, mm-hmm. you don't have to do anything. You just ignore it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you can play with that at first and see, um, you know, that's like the online. It's like when you're in a bar and you look across the room mm-hmm. and you glance at the guy, you either hold his, his eye and then look down, mm-hmm. uh, that's the like. Mm. Wow. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've, I've had a lot of women like me, but that's as far as they go. Well, then you're supposed to email them back. Well, usually I'd be on, I'd be on stage when that would happen, and they'd be about 78 uh, years old, and they like my jokes, you know? Here's a, here's okay, a, so, here's a thought ahead. that just, just kind of came to me. Is there a... Is there a danger point when writing your profile or sending out the first email or with the likes of giving out too much information? I remember my grandmother used to say, you don't have to divulge everything about yourself right off the bat. And, and I'm kind of trying to think, do these sites expect you to divulge everything about yourself or is it just a little bit uh, of an appetizer? And then when you get into the relationship, you begin to learn about each other like anything else. Well, you want to divulge what would be the deal breakers or makers. So, for mm-hmm. example, if you have children, you should mm-hmm. put, I have two, like, two children and put their ages. Mm-hmm. Because you, wanna, you don't want to waste your time with somebody who's not interested in someone with children of those ages or even with children. You want to put, um, you, you definitely don't want to put, I mean, where you live. I mean, you could put the city, yeah. but you don't want to have address. You don't want to put your phone number on there. Uh, you don't want to put any, uh, for example, you don't want to say, I work at Ryder, you know, the name of the company, mm-hmm. uh, because those things put you in danger of having somebody stalk you or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, so you have to put enough information so that they can realize whether they're interested and also rule out any deal breakers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but not we- so much that you put yourself at risk. You also talk about uh, the first – you said the first emails and breaking the ice. Um, what if you're awkward? I mean what if you're really awkward about breaking the ice? You're extremely shy whether you be a man or a woman. How do you overcome that? That's why you take my my webinar. Um, but one of the things okay. – one of the things that you don't do is, for example, if you're a man – one of the lamest emails is, hi, beautiful, and that's it. Okay, mm-hmm. so that tells me he maybe looked at my picture, but he's doing that to 50 others. Yeah. So what? So a good email would be uh, pointing out something that shows that you read her profile. Oh. So I, I liked when you said this. And that intrigued me. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that shows, okay, he read the profile. He actually might be really looking for somebody if it's the right person. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to answer that. But what do you say if somebody says, hi, beautiful? Or if you're a woman, um, men or women should never email uh, something suggestive. Uh-huh. Or something about your looks. It should be more about the content. Because no one wants to be objectified. Yes, true, true. And so... Uh, so you can, you know, say something about their profile and you can maybe share one little fact about yourself. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it sounds like we might have something in common, you know, some things in common. Please take a look at my profile. So that's short and to the point. Mm-hmm. 
and, and that makes it easy. And then the other person at that point can look at the profile and say, oh, yes, I'm interested, and then the other person can write back. But generally speaking, you want to use a sense of humor. You want to, uh, you know, not be, uh, no sexual innuendos, no harassments, nothing Mm -hmm. weird. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, we have people out there who don't know when to pull back on any of that. We've got a, about four or five minutes left here. We're talking to Natalie Moore. It's a match, the guide to finding lasting love. Let's talk about the first date, do's and don'ts. Okay, the first date, you really want to figure out if this is somebody you want to see again <clears throat> or not. So that means you, you go and you actually have a list of questions to see, uh, that you want to have answered throughout the evening, but you want to do it in a conversational tone. You mm-hmm. want to find out about the person, more about them. Uh, for example, you want to see how he interacts with the people around. You want to see, uh, you'll see things like, oh, is that a heavy drinker or not? But you'll also find out, you know, about it. You say, oh, you know, what, tell me about your family. Uh, do you come? Do you have a lot of siblings? Watch what they tell you. Listen to what they tell you, because mm-hmm. they'll tell you a lot of things, and just keep it in the conversation. Um, and so, after you basically, I have a list of things that you that, of questions for the first date that you want to find out. And it's not an interrogation, but it's really about getting to know the most uh, about the person in a short period of time, because you want to limit it to about an hour. Mm-hmm. And also to see if there's any chemistry, because no matter how wonderful the person is, if you don't have chemistry with them, it's not going to really work out. Yeah. It can be a friendship, but it's not going to be a, a love relationship. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, people can just go on my blog and I have an article, a blog that's free for anybody to look at on the first questions, uh, first date do's and don'ts. And, and uh, you know, you're, you're starting out. And you're 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 dating, but you don't want to appear to be too flirtatious, whether you're a man or a woman. You don't want to come on too strong either way, which would be some don'ts not to do. I'm assured that that's probably part of it. But you want to come across friendly and nice and and warm and congenial, Um, you know. But if there's awkwardness, I guess things aren't going to really work out unless both people are awkward because they haven't been dating in a while. Well, sometimes you can just say, you know, I'm feeling a little awkward. I haven't, go- I haven't been dating for a, for a while. Yeah. And because you're being authentic and the other person is probably feeling awkward and then go, oh yeah, I'm feeling that way too. God, I'm so glad you told me that. Well, that's, and that's that what happened. break yeah. the ice. Yeah. That's what happened between me and the young lady that I'm seeing now. You remember I, I told you she wanted right. to take it one step at a time. She's just come out of a terrible relationship And so, and I said, yeah, I haven't really dated in years either. So, you know, um, let's take this one step at a time. And if it takes us a year before we, you know, first of all, we live a little distance from each other and it's really been fine. It's been very comfortable and very nice. And, and, and she's always there for me and, and I'm there for her. I end up calling her more than me. She's extremely busy, but, but I think the comfort level has to be there. And I think that's what you teach in your book here, which is it's a match, the guide to finding lasting love with Natalie Moore. We've got ourselves about a minute to go here. Uh, In summing all of this up, Natalie, uh, talk about where people can reach you. Talk about people where uh, they can get a hold of you for your seminars and and all that's involved. Well, the best place to reach me is through my website, Mm -hmm. www.nataliemoore.net. I have a contact form there and I have uh, other ways you can also reach me through social media, um, and of course, you know you can reading my book, and I have a blog that's free. So if you go to my website and you want to look at through my blog post, you're welcome to mm-hmm. uh, to do that. And I always put a lot of information there and on social media. I and I I want to leave everybody with the thought that I truly believe that everyone can find their lasting love. Yeah. It might not happen in one day, one week or six months, or even two years. But your lasting love is out there. You just have to know how to find, get him, keep him. 
Absolutely. It's Natalie Moore has joined us. It's a match. The Guide to Finding Lasting Love, and Natalie's going to come back with us in a couple of months and talk more as we go further into the book. We'll talk about online dating, and we'll update you as we go along. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us here on The Express. And before we say goodnight to everybody, I just want to remind you, you can follow me on Facebook at Gary Allen, A-L-A-N. This show, along with other past shows, is on YouTube.com, Gary Allen, The Express Interviews. Thursday night at 7 p.m., the show will repeat itself on our sister network, diversitybroadcastnetwork.com. It'll also go to progressivevoices.com. You can listen in to tunein.com. Go on there. Mention TMV Cafe as one of your favorites. And you can listen to us and other shows here on the network at any time. And uh, Natalie, thank you so very, very much. And thank you to all of you out there for taking the time out of your day to join us. Until next week, please take care of yourselves thank you, Gary, and each other. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. You've been listening to The Express with Gary Allen. Join us here every Tuesday night at 10 for more captivating talk with Gary Allen. See you next time on The Express.